evening. I'm the Reverend Dr. Rodney S. Sadler, Jr. I teach Bible and serve as the director of the Office for Social Justice and Reconciliation. I'd like to welcome you all to this, our first time dangerous dialogue via Zoom. So you all are part of history here. I remember many years ago working with the Congress of National Black Churches back in the early 90s and having a conference that dealt with sexuality in the black church at the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic. It was well attended and ministers from across the country gathered with health experts and government policy people to help us learn about the crisis and what we could do to help stem the tide. After a particularly good plenary session, there was a breakout group and all the pastors were placed in small groups and told to talk about what they'd heard and what they learned. And after the workshop leader gave instructions and left the stage, a strange silence fell over all those who were gathered in this massive ballroom. It was as though none of those who were there were willing to be the first to talk, to talk about sex. Sex and sexuality are often among the most dangerous topics of dialogue for church leaders. The silence of those pastors belied this reality. Each of them was not ignorant about sex. I know that the members of their congregations were clearly having sex. The fact that they are constantly new Christians, Christian and dedicated, is a testimony not only to the success of our evangelism, but to the facts that Christians are sexual beings who are still having sex and still producing babies. Yet we're often silent when it comes to talking about sex. Some of us as religious leaders are afraid to present a message that might contradict what they imagine to be a sexually sterile view of God's word or in the Bible. Others are afraid of offending older, more conservative members of their congregations. Others are concerned that what they might say might lead younger Christians astray from, a, from the presumed biblical notion of the norm for sexuality. Often pastors and Christian educators are frightened by what they believe about sex and that it might be uh, misconstrued by the congregations that they pastor or they teach, so they're afraid to speak openly. So far too often, the choice of faith communities has been to be silent in conversations about sex and sexuality. Well, today we're trying to break that trend. Tonight, I want to invite you into a dangerous dialogue about human sexuality called holy people and holy sex. We want to talk about one of the most taboo subjects in the church to address, sex, sexuality, gender identity, and the politics associated with the most private aspects of our lives. I will say as we begin this conversation, God made sex. God does not want us to be afraid of sex. Not afraid to say it, not afraid to have it, not afraid to talk about it, not afraid to reimagine what it might look like, not even afraid to reimagine who might legitimately have it, not afraid of this most natural and necessary dimension of our own base humanity. I also hope that we will begin to see that the Bible is not at all silent about sex. From the passionate vision of celebrating sex in the Song of Songs, to the explicit sexual imagery of Hosea and the prophets, to the fact that the second story in scripture in Genesis 2 ends with an image of two naked people unashamedly engaging in sex, to the constant use of euphemisms in the Bible like come into and lie with and know, to Jesus forgiving a woman who had engaged in what we might deem an illicit and out of bounds sexual act, to Paul's concern about marriage so that people did not burn with passion because of thwarted sex. Sex is throughout the biblical canon, Tonight, you might hear some things that will challenge what you think you know, what you've been taught to believe, what you think scripture says, and even the ways that you've read scripture in relationship to gender, sex, and sexuality. I hope as we begin this conversation, we do so with open minds, open hearts, and a dedication to discern not a politically correct view, not a secularly popular view, but a view that is faithful to God and faithful to scripture. Our speakers tonight include the Reverend Melissa McQueen Simmons, who coordinates panel discussions and relevant social justice issues regarding the LGBTQ community and the Black church. She conducts necessary research on the Black church 
community and ongoing sources regarding biblical scholarship and sexuality. She also assists in helping pastors and religious leaders address social and theological dimensions of sexual relations in the African American community, particularly as it relates to LGBTQ equality. She helps institutions create racially inclusive based spaces, and she currently serves as the North Carolina organizer for Many Voices, a Black church movement for gay and transgender justice. Our second speaker this evening is an ordained United Methodist minister, the Reverend Dr. Tim Moore, who received his Doctor of Ministry degree from Hood Theological Seminary. Dr. Moore has served local congregations and campus ministries in the Mid-Atlantic and worked in administrative positions in the, on the denominational level with the United Methodist Church. Currently, Dr. Moore serves as the, the Director of Donor Development at Union Presbyterian Seminary. That means he's our local money guy. He's the author and editor of numerous articles and books, including Displaced Persons, Theological Reflections on Immigration, Refugees, and Marginalization. The latter volume, this volume, which includes the chapter Exploring Human Sexuality in the Church, from which you'll speak tonight. Before we get started, a few notes of housekeeping. The first thing I want to say is I want everyone to please mute your computers as we begin this conversation to make sure that we can hear what's being said. The second thing is after the conversation, we want to be able to have a, a question and answer session with our speakers. And we'll handle this today by utilizing the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. If you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, just off center, there's a, a little thing that you can click that says chat. If you want to go in there and type a question that you might have, please go in and do so. Uh, Aaron, our, the coordinator for the center, will collect those questions and try to, try to bring them together if they're replicated questions and present them to me so that I can ask them of the speakers a little bit later on in our conversation. So if you have any questions, please put them there. If you have multiple questions, please try to figure out which one you really want to ask so that we make, make sure that we can move with a good sense of alacrity. Uh, in the aftermath of this conversation, I also want to let you know that the speakers uh, want, who wanted to bring resources with them tonight to show you all, uh, they've said that they're going to post those for us. So we'll be able to post them on our Facebook page, uh, any resources that might be relevant for you in the aftermath of this conversation. So before I do anything else, let me open up by inviting Reverend Melissa McQueen Simmons to speak to us for the first few minutes. Melissa. Good, after good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, I with for my time with you, I will offer a reading. I will offer a mini lecture on the components of human sexuality, and I will share how you can make a sex affirming faith space. So I invite you to relax as I begin to read. We are holy beings from Lynn Young and T. Michael Rock. We are holy beings created in the very image of God, divinely and precisely made, knit together in our mother's wombs, each with an exquisite pattern of our very own. Jesus was incarnate, human and whole, and so are we, intricately, and divinely made, head and heart, penis and vulva, ovaries and testicles, breasts and nipples, large and small. And God said, it is good. We reclaim our God-given bodies and the incredible gift of our sexuality. We delight in what it means to be whole, we reclaim holy language for our bodies, holy words which embrace the values of justice, wholeness, respect, and inclusivity. We celebrate God's creation of each other, each cell, each hair, each inch of skin, each breath. We mix and stir sexuality and spirituality together. We blend together our bodies, minds and spirits 
reuniting every part of our God-given selves so that we might once again become whole. We have not fallen from the garden. We are the garden. We are the fruit. We are called to a true invitation to taste, eat, and be, and become. What a wondrous gift. I just want to express my gratitude for the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation for giving me an opportunity to share about religion and sexuality in the church. So I want to introduce to some of you all or reintroduce to some um, a very helpful model for understanding human sexuality. As you can see, there are five interconnecting circles. All of the circles interrelate and are influenced by factors such as our family background, culture, religion, the media, etc. Many people in our society view sexuality narrowly, focusing only on one of these circles, the sexual health and reproduction circle. Most education and public schools around the country focuses on this circle. I'm gonna begin with sensuality. Sensuality is accepting and enjoying one's own body and its ability to respond sexually, as well as enjoying the body and responsiveness of a sexual partner. Sensuality has everything to do with our bodies, how we feel about the body, how it looks and feels and what it can do. It involves being aware of and in touch with the pleasure of our bodies and how our bodies can give pleasure to others as well. Body image, our attitudes and feelings about our bodies and ideas are influenced by the media and other elements of our culture of what is and what is not attractive. The sexual response cycle, the sequence of physical attraction or desire, pleasure, and sometimes release from sexual tension. The human body has been created or programmed to respond in certain ways to touch and pleasurable feelings. This programming takes a person through a process that begins with feeling turned on and may end with orgasm, either alone or with a sexual partner. Skin hunger, the human need to be touched, stroked, and held. Skin-to-skin -skin contact can make people feel connected, comfortable, and relaxed, and physically stimulated. Fantasy as a means of sexual expression. These are those thoughts and dreams and stories uh, with sexual themes. And this is a safe way explore of ex exploring feelings. And such thoughts do not necessarily turn into actions. And then there is oral and visual stimuli. The things we hear or oral or see that are arousing to us. A song that may remind us of someone we care about, an image that may spark a fantasy, a smell may also give a pleasurable experience. And then there's intimacy. This is the emotional closeness with another person. It focuses on how we relate to others in emotional terms. As with sensuality suggests physical closeness, relationships which provide the vehicle for creating intimacy gives us a sense of belonging, connection, and affection. They can take the form of friendships, family relationships, and romantic relationships. Romantic relationships may or may not include sexual contact. Sexual behavior can happen without an emotional connection, but it's not nearly as fulfilling as a sexual behavior with an emotional connection. Intimacy um, includes liking or loving another person, having a strong emotional attachment or connection to them, emotional risk-taking, being open and honest, 
taking the risk to tell someone our true feelings, concerns, and attitudes in spite of the possibility of being laughed at or rejected. Reciprocity, giving back to a person who gives to us. As sexual beings, we have intimacy, we can have intimacy with or without engaging in sexual behavior. A mature expression of sexuality often includes both intimacy and sexual behavior. And as two or more people express the fullness of their relationships with, the, with each other, some people don't experience sexual attraction, but they still may have the desire to have emotional closeness and romantic intimacy. And then there's sexual identity which is the one I believe is the most extensive. Sexual identity is who we are as a sexual people. And this also includes our gender. Sexual identity can be thought of as five different pieces. Biological sex or the sex you were assigned at birth, which includes the physical package you were born with, your genitals, inter internal reproductive organs, chromosomes, and hormones. Most people think that there are only two biological sexes, male and female. However, there are people who do not fit neatly into either sex. Females typically have a vulva, a vagina, a uterus, ovaries, two X chromosomes, and estrogen as their predominant sex hormone. Males typically have a penis, testicles, an X and Y chromosome, and testosterone as their predominant sex hormone. People whose sex has not, people who are assigned intersex have a balance of hormones and physical characteristics that do not fit typically definitions of male or female. Gender identity is a person's internal psychological sense of their gender. This could be boy, man, girl, woman, a mixture of boy, man, and girl, woman, transgender, or somewhere else on the gender spectrum. And some people might identify as genderqueer. Usually, but not always, this identity matches a person's biological sex. Some people whose biological sex and gender identity are not in alignment use the term transgender. Some intersex individuals identify their gender as intersex, while others may have a strong sense of being a boy man or girl woman. So this, this is the I. Whenever you see the LGBTQ plus alphabet, this is one of the I's that's, that's listed. Gender expression is how a person expresses their gender to others through clothing, hairstyle, behavior, speech patterns, mannerisms, etc. This can be masculine, feminine, or a combination of both or neither. Gender roles are the social and cultural expectations of appropriate behavior for men and women. Gender roles are what we tend to think of as typical fe feminine and masculine traits. Individuals behave in certain ways because they're internalized. They've internalized societal and cultural messages about appropriate behaviors for men and women. So sexual orientation is how a person's feeling of attraction toward other people in, in terms of emotions, romance, and or sexual attraction. Some people are attracted to a different gender than their own. Others are attracted to the same gender. Others are attracted to the same and a different gender. Some people are attracted to only one gender. Others are attracted to two or more genders. Some people aren't sexually attracted to anyone. 
And people use different labels to describe their sexual orientation, such as heterosexual or straight, queer. A long time ago, queer was a term that was deemed derogatory, but uh, millennials and some Gen Xers and other younger generations are using queer as a blanket to describe their sexual orientation. There's same sex attracted, same gender loving, there's gay, lesbian, or bisexual, pansexual, and asexual. And these labels can mean different things to different people. For some people, sexual orientation feels fixed and stays the same their whole life. But for others, sexual orientation is fluid or may shift over the course of their life. And the one that is the most popular is sexual health and reproduction. So this circle focuses on the attitudes and behaviors related to reproduction, consequences of sexual intercourse, oral, anal, and vaginal, and caring for sexual reproductive organs. While sexuality is much more than sexual intercourse, it includes sexual intercourse and the human capacity to reproduce, even though uh, many, the very young and the very old, some gay men, bisexuals, and lesbians, people who don't desire children, and infertile couples do not use that capacity. So facts about reproduction. How a male and female reproductive system works, how conception occurs, and how the fetus develops inside a person with typical female organs. Feelings and attitudes about sexual behavior or our values, like what have we been taught? Like what do we carry? Our opinions regarding uh, sexual behavior and reproduction. And these include pregnancy, parenthood, STIs, HIV infection, and the use of contraception, sexual intercourse, oral, anal, and vaginal sexual intercourse, and the risk related to each. Contraception and abortion, ways to plan when to become a parent and prevent unplanned, parents, unplanned pregnancy, options for dealing with unintended pregnancy, and discussing protection and options with sexual partners sexually transmitted infections and risk reductions, ways to prevent infection with HIV and other STIs, deciding on forms of protection and discussing the subject with sexual partners, seeking preventative care from health care pro providers and reproductive health centers as needed. And I know I've shared a lot of information with you. And I will definitely be available for questions after this. So while we see that there are, I have shared about four circles so far, there is another circle titled sexualism. The use of sex or sexuality to influence, manipulate, or control other people. These forms of exploitation range from harmless manipulation to extreme violence and can include flirting. And flirting becomes sexualization when the intention is to manipulate or control. But it can otherwise be a wonderful way to let someone know you are attracted to them. Seduction is subtle or unsubtle pressure to engage in sexual activity. Seduction can also be an aspect of intimacy when it is mutual. Withholding sex is using the refusal of sexual activity as a negotiating or bargaining tool. Sexual harassment is any unwelcome verbal or physical sexual advance or conduct, including unwelcome requests for sexual favors. Sexual assault is any type of sexual contact or behavior that occurs without explicit consent of the recipient. 
It can consist of physical and or psychological threats and or taking advantage of someone who is unable to give consent, such as someone impaired by alcohol or other drugs. Rape is a form of sexual assault. Incest is sexual intercourse between persons too closely related to legally marry. Sexualization can occur on a personal level, such as when one person sexually harasses or abuses another face-to-face, -face, online, or by text. It can also occur on a societal level, such as when accused rapists are believed more readily than victims, or when video games, contests, attractiveness, rankings, the media, and common knowledge imply that only certain people are attractive or have a right to be sexually active. For example, the intimacy needs of older adults are often overlooked and joked about. So what do we do with this, this model, the circles of sexuality? I'm hoping that this have given you an opportunity to see how expressive and how many components are involved when it comes to our human sexuality and other factors um, in how we live. How can we use this in our faith space? How can we create a sex affirming faith space or a sex positive faith space? And being sex positive is not about the amount of or frequency of the sex you are having, but being sex positive and sex affirming is your attitude about sex. The first thing you can do is educate yourself on experiences other than your own. As leaders in our faith spaces or congregations, if we are interested in growing our congregation and opening our our hearts and minds and spirits to what else is out there and being able to create a no judgment zone, it's gonna be important to understand that there are different types of relationships other than the one that you are involved in. There are people that are monogamous, uh, polyamorous. There are people in open relationships and open marriages. There are people who practice abstinence and there are also people who are celibate. So to, to create this uh, affirming faith space, we can advocate for sexual education. I, I facilitate a curriculum called Our Whole Lives, Sexuality and Our Faith, which is uh, partnered with the United Church of Christ and the Unitarian Universalist Association. And that is a uh, faith-based sexuality education that, um, is age appropriate and begins with kindergartners all the way through older adults. And there are other sex education um, curriculums that you could possibly use in your church. You can also look at the liturgy you use and use an inclusive language for God. So that could be a reminder that everybody is made in God's image. Even in the way you share your resources and your worship resources from your bulletin to your website, to uh, posters and flyers that are up, have all types of bodies so and abilities so people can feel affirmed in your faith space. And then you can also create a table of resources that will include external and internal condoms and dental dams and information about how to have safe sex and information from the clinic, clinic that just shares what different types of uh, contraceptive are and also a list of books that people can read to explore and understand what human sexuality is and how sexuality and spirituality is related. And the, the last thing that I'll lift up is when it comes to creating your sermon or your homily, introduce those texts that are controversial, introduce those texts that make people feel uncomfortable. And, and, and even bring in those texts in Bible study, you know, those texts that people use um, to condemn homosexuality or to um, express uh, typical 
uh, or gender roles that society has created, don't be afraid to talk about those and see where your congregation is when it comes to sexuality. And I think this is a perfect segue to invite Reverend Dr. Tim Moore to share. Thank you very much. I think I'm up and going. I appreciate it very much, uh, Melissa, your offering what you have offered. It's a good way to transition as we begin to think about our next, next part of the program. So um, moments ago, we spoke about the issues of, um, of human sexuality and the sort of the broad ranges of it. And now we're going to think about what it means when we think about scripture. Um, specifically, when we think about scripture, when we are engaging in these conversations, we're assuming that um, the reason I introduced scripture into this conversation is that oftentimes scripture is one of the first places people go when they want to have conversations about human sexuality within the life of the church. And it's a legitimate place to, to have the conversation, to, uh, to begin conversations there, or to at least uh, engage those uh, parts of um, the faith that are vital and important uh, based around scripture. But it's also to begin to get us to think about one, uh, I guess, two assumptions when we enter into the conversation about human sexuality um, and the church is that when we introduce the conversations and talk about scripture, we're assuming we're parts of communities that are interested in the idea of, um, of scripture. The scripture is vital and important to somehow naming or structuring or giving shape to the kinds of behaviors and practices that we think are appropriate for people who are part of our traditions to engage in. So we're already based on, we're already operating on a kind of an assumption when we enter into the conversation uh, with the use of scripture, is that scripture is important. The question is, how is scripture important? So that's, that's one sort of caveat to have is that we've already made that assumption. The other one is, is that we need to, I think this is the first part of the conversation we'll have tonight, is to recognize that when we talk about scripture, we need to understand what it is that we mean when we say scripture. Because we all might come into the conversation assuming that we know what we're talking about, uh, that we assume that we know what it is that other people are um, uh, meaning when they say that scripture is important to them or that uh, they use scripture in a particular way. The question is, do we understand that we're even using it in the same ways? So we might all commonly agree that we're using scripture, but we might not recognize that we're even using it the same way. So we're going to spend today a, a quick exercise. We're going to first um, talk about what scripture says, and we'll do a, a quick, short, interpretive exercise to look at passages in the scripture generally. And then we'll do an exploration of a particular biblical text. So those are the, those sort of the three stages we're going to go into tonight. And, and I recognize we have um, uh, a limited amount of time, so we're not going to possibly cover everything we could talk about. So we're going to try to be as streamlined as possible, um, but it's a way of introducing the conversation, how it is we might talk about issues of sex and sexuality, the utilization of scripture in that conversation. So what is scripture? Well, a few things to first to recognize here. We oftentimes talk about scripture. We talk about our approaches to scripture and about exegesis. That is the analysis of the text. The other one is to talk about hermeneutics, and hermeneutics is the interpretation of the text. And hermeneutics and exegesis are closely related to each other, but they're slightly different. Uh, the way I distinguish them is that I would talk about exegesis as a first order exercise. In other words, it's asking, what does scripture say? And the second one is that hermeneutics is, is asking a second order exercise, which is, what does scripture mean? Um, as a biblical um, uh, studies professor I had years ago, uh, Richard Baucom, I used to always say, um, the, the question is, what did scripture mean and what does it mean? So those are the two tensions you're always wrestling with. And when we talk about the utilization of scripture, oftentimes we don't recognize we might be actually talking about two different functions of scripture. One might be a first order, one might be a second order function. The other one is to think about when we talk about what the Bible is. So what do we think when we say scripture? Um, what do we think about how we're going to investigate scripture? What kind of techniques will we use? What kind of languages will we read? Will we do comparative analysis between the various texts? Will we look at the various translations? And then the question is, once we've done this kind of work, do we even have an idea about what it is that we want to do or how it is we want to apply the results of that work? So these are all kinds of information that we need to not just assume, but be conscious of in our conversations about the utilization of scripture. And oftentimes when we talk about scripture, we talk about it as, uh, it comes from this, this word, we call it the canon. It comes from a, 
a word that the word uh, cana, which is a, a reed or a cane. And the question is, it was a measuring rod, and so that asks us what is being measured. That's what the word um, cane means. It was meant to be some sort of a measuring tool. So the question is, if scripture is meant to be a measuring tool, what is being measured? Is it measuring the community? Is it measuring the, itself against itself to count what counts as orthodox or appropriate teachings for the church? So these are all important things to think about when we're thinking about what we're talking about or explore when we're thinking about what it is we're saying when we say scripture. Also, when we talk about scripture, are we talking about 66 books or 78 books? Are we including uh, the, the Apocrypha in our conversations about scripture? Are we talking about the Old and the New Testament or the Old over the New Testament or the New over the Old Testament? Is there a tension between which translations we're relying upon, which original text, which fragments? These are all assumptions that are oftentimes lie beneath the surface in our conversation about Scripture that we're not even aware are there. So I think it's important for us to, to recognize that when we begin to say Scripture is important to us, the question is which Scripture and how is it that I'm utilizing Scripture? So we need to unpack those kind of conversations people have. Because oftentimes I've discovered when I have these conversations in communities of people, when they're discussing issues of human sexuality and how it is they utilize scripture in their conversations and within their community, they recognize they're not even using the book itself, the Bible, in the same way. They're approaching it differently. So they think they might have in common, they think scripture is important, but they don't even have in common what it is they think they're doing with scripture or what scripture is. And then um, some attitudes about scripture. So oftentimes we talk about scripture as being inspired, that is, when it was written and, and when it is read, or the scripture is infallible as regarding uh, doctrine and life and how it instructs us in doctrine and life. We talk about scripture as being inerrant. Um, people will describe scripture as inerrant. What they mean by that typically is in its original text and its original form. We talk about scripture as being um, authoritative. But just because something's authoritative, there's also a tension there. Uh, does the word mean to authorize or does it mean to author? There's a tension and a sort of a discrepancy between authorize and author. Um, authorize means you have permission. Whereas an author has sort of a creative possibility. So does scripture give us permission to do things, or does it offer us the creative possibility to try things and to understand things differently? There's some tensions in scriptural interpretation based on the utilization of this concept of scriptural authority. And also, how does scripture then fit into our theology? So even if we've come to some sort of conclusion that scripture might mean something important to us, and that we gather some sort of data or information that's important from scripture, then the question is, then how do we apply it to the sort of theological basis or the ethical forms that we are constructing? So it might fit in there, but how does it fit in? So we might talk about sola scriptura, that is that scripture has this primary central position, not an exclusive position, but a, a primary position. Sometimes we talk about scripture as being bifocal, it's in tension with tradition. So they kind of, they kind of stand in kind of mutually informing and critiquing positions of each other. Sometimes it's described as the, uh, the leg of a stool, um, in tension with uh, reason and tradition. And then you might hear it as part of a quadrilateral, which is uh, in tension with reason, tradition, and experience. And technically within the quadrilateral, there are actually a sort of two tiers of understanding there, is that the quadrilateral typically describes tradition and scripture as um, sort of the sources of information with reason and experience as the interpretive modes by which you engage those two sources. So there's even kind of layers of understanding within the quadrilateral notion of scripture. So we have this, this, this whole kind of multi-layered and complex understanding of what scripture is. And just because we come into the assumption that scripture is important, we need, need to unpack what it means for us to think how it is a scripture fits into the, the theological and ethical constructs that we are forming. So it's very important for us to recognize that just because we say scripture is important, we don't necessarily understand or haven't been conscious about how it is we, we think scripture is being used. Um, what it is that people are assuming about Scripture, and how does it we are assuming Scripture might fit within the structure, social and, uh, and ethical constructs that we are developing. So just trying to raise those to the, uh, from the subliminal to the, uh, to the conscious level in our conversations about Scripture and the, uh, theology. And that helped us form our notions about human sexuality. And then lastly, we often think about the function of Scripture differently. Some of us utilize or think about scripture as a GPS, like a point-to-point -point navigation system, where we think scripture tells us exactly where we need to go, um, all the steps along the way. Others of us think of scripture as more like a roadmap, and that uh, we think scripture gives us some, uh, some vital information, uh, but we need to make some choices along the way. Others of us see scripture as a compass, 
and it might point us in the right direction, but it doesn't tell us that there are mountains over there or rivers up, upcoming, or there might be um, uh, a great ocean before us. So there's a lot of information we have to gain along the way that scripture cannot supply. Sometimes we see scripture as an icon. It's the thing that we pass through, like the, uh, like the app on your phone. It's not the thing itself, but it's the thing that gets you to the thing that's important to you. So we see that as an icon, something you pass through. And some of us approach scripture as an artifact, the thing that we um, uh, simply study, but don't see how it has any kind of relevancy to our lives today. So these are important things to understand, and not just when we're talking about scripture, we're talking about the function of scripture, that we recognize how it is that we think we might be utilizing this in our own kind of construction of ethical practices. I'm going to now move us to an interpretive exercise. And Rodney, this is what we talked about uh, the other day, that this might be a moment for us to maybe engage into some conversation. Are you, um, you want to unmute yourself, Rodney, for a moment? Certainly. Yeah. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to introduce some texts. And so these, these texts have nothing to do with human sexuality. These texts just are some texts from Scripture. I want us to see how it is that we might utilize or we do utilize um, ways of interpreting texts and applying those texts to our own ethical constructs and the way we kind of engage with them today. So I'm going to use some of these texts and present them to us. I'll read them out. So this is a Leviticus text, Leviticus 19. Um, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to, every, to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. That's a text from uh, the Old Testament. And so then the question is, when we're thinking about this, are we thinking about this as a teaching to be followed exactly how it is written, or is it meant to be understood in its context and reinterpreted for ours? Right. So that's sort of like, if you could imagine putting these in two boxes, which box do you think this particular text might belong in? I'll leave that open to anybody wants to ask or comment. Would you like to invite some participation? Yes, please. Please. Uh, so if, you have a, if you'd like to answer this question, please unmute yourself and jump in. Since we're so shy today, yeah. I might jump in and say there's a, perhaps a bit of both involved in this yeah. first week. Yeah. Uh, in, in part, you see that uh, internally, it starts off as a passage that's meant to help people wrestle with the uh, reality of dealing with those who are impoverished by allowing some of the food to be left on the vine so that those who are poor who are impoverished might glean and therefore sustain their lives. But if you look at the passage, and you understand the original intent of the context, you might recognize as well that there is an intent to uh, utilize this to frame a larger discourse. How do we deal with wealth and poverty? How do we deal with abundance and lack? And uh, by looking at this as a larger thematic principle, we might be able to discern other ways of dealing with things like, oh, I don't know, uh, income, wealth, inequality in our own context today. So, so the, the text itself is, is uh, complex and that it provides many opportunities for interpretation and application. That, uh, that is sort of helpful there. Right, let's go to the next one. You shall not round off the hair on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. You shall not make any gashes in your flesh um, <clears throat> for the dead or tattoo any marks upon, uh, upon you. I am the Lord. Right, so is this a teaching to be followed exactly how it is written or is it meant to be understood in its context or reinterpreted for ours? What do you all think? So I'm speaking to Cedric. I would say that again, it is a, it's a layered text. Some would use it as a way to issue a prohibition against tools. And then again, it allows for us to consider um, when we apply the text as um, prescriptive, mm -hmm. uh, and when we decide that scripture should be used I, as a, pro a prohibition against certain things, behaviors, actions. Excellent. 
Yeah, so it, so there, there there's um there's some value in in uh, the interpretation uh, that some people might use it in a way to um prohibit certain behaviors and others might see it um as a way to try to guide behaviors but not necessarily as a as a strict dictum for current practices and habits. Hopefully that's a a summary. Tim, I'm assuming you've got <laughs> to figure out what tattoos and gashes in the skin meant in its original yeah. context and then yeah. find an analogy for us today. And I'm not sure this is simply talking about tattoos or not. Uh, so yeah, just yeah. like I said in the former one, you know, if you're not a farmer, reaping doesn't say anything to you. Right. So everything's got to be reinterpreted. That's right. So there, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a value to the, um, the critical engagement with the text to understand its context and try to understand its relevancy for our context. Um, no, I think it's, it's I think it's, it's extremely vital to understand what a particular what what tattooing might have meant in that that context in the same way that um that gashing of skin might have had a particular religious or cultural expression that might have been pushed against as opposed to a, a flat out ban against tattooing or cutting of skin right so that's a contextual understanding or interpretation of the text. Um, well, let's move on to uh, to this Leviticus text. We've got several of these. I might kind of push us forward quickly. You'll see kind of see a pattern of them developing here. If a man commits, commits adultery with his wife, uh, the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. And so, um, to be followed exactly as written, or to understand or interpret it in its context. Any particular thoughts? I'm going, to, I'm going to push us through. I'm going to get us to a, I think I have um, a, a New Testament text upcoming. I want to get us into the New Testament to see this is not just a, some Old Testament passages. Um, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of the members of, than for the whole body to, to go into hell. So again, is this a text to be just simply followed by it as written, or do we need to understand its context and interpret it for ours? What do you think? It's um, reject that um, what makes you sin. Okay. So it's, uh, I think it's um, interpreted. Right, so you've, you've interpreted it somehow and sort of drawn out a piece that seems to be relevant and has sort of a broader application. I'm not taking it seriously. I'm as black as they come. We can get this. And it just amazes me how uh, everybody in the country, they're calling the Doomsday Guy. A lot of them think that you guys are paying me to do these interviews and they're doubting me. Instead of me getting angry like I have, I'm telling people, Yeah, there's a there's a there's a interference there somewhere. Yeah, I didn't understand what they were saying. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the. Rota. I think that's someone's TV. Forgive yeah, me. I'm gonna move on to the to the next one. Please. Um, uh, and everything you d you do, do it to others as you would have them do it to you. For this law and the prophet. Is it teaching we should follow now or teaching um, as exactly as written or one that's meant to be understood in its context and reinterpreted for ours? Thank you. <laughs> 
Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling in singleness of heart as you obey Christ. This is a teaching to be followed exactly as is written or is it meant to be understood in its context and reinterpreted for ours? Don't get Rodney started. We'll be here all night. God bless him. <laughs> all right. But well, I think I think we might see sort of the um the the direction that these were were going is that um is that when we think about um how do we categorize most of these verses? Where do they do they live in sort of this absolute position or do we do we sort of nimbly engage them with a skill to allow them to both be read in their context, but also have some relevancy to our particular um, lives and uh, the way we engage with each other in our um, sort of day-to-day -day interactions. And so generally what, I, what I'm trying to put across is, at least lift up for us, is that we seem to possess some sort of um, negotiating skill that we already are fairly um, sophisticated in when it comes to the reading of Scripture. That we engage with Scripture with this capacity um, to be able to, um, to both uh, read Scripture and to appreciate it, but also to understand that there might, Scripture might require sort of a deep reading that doesn't require us to reject what it's saying, but maybe to understand it in its context, and then to also understand how it might be applied to our context in a different way or in a reinterpreted way to have relevancy or understanding that makes sense. Um, I'm going to now move us quickly to an exploration of a particular biblical text. And Melissa, a moment ago, when she was mentioning sort of these kind of texts that people oftentimes speak about, this is one of those texts that, that um, are several, these are the seven typical texts that oftentimes people will lift up as texts that have to do with human sexuality, particular homosexuality within the life of the church. So we've, we've spent some time talking about how it is that people use scripture generally, and then we shifted to thinking a little bit about how it is that um, we might creatively or, or nimbly engage the text. Now we're going to think about um, how it is we, we might engage with a particular text. And these are the seven texts that have to do oftentimes are lifted up that have to do with human sexuality and homosexuality in the church. And we're going to spend some time looking at 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. And this is a common text uh, that you might have heard. Uh, this is the text. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, but for the lawless and the disobedient. For the godless and the sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father and mother, for murderers, for pornos, or senecuites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. So you see there's a, a list there, which is um, oftentimes referred to as a vice list, this list of some things that are bad. Um, but I've deliberately not translated out of the Greek two words, words that oftentimes have a... Um, sort of a sexual connection or connotation to them. I've deliberately left the words pornos and arsenicuites left untranslated, and we're going to spend some time trying to understand how best these might be translated for us to utilize and understand um, in our own reading and application of the text. And so, what are they? What do these words mean? Well, there are several ways to kind of tackle how we might understand some words, and those might be through um, a, a lovely word study. We're going to do a quick word study. Uh, so these are, these are how the word pornos is translated in both uh, the first is the NIV, the next one is the King James, and the last word there is from the uh, New Revised Standard Version. So fornicators, whoremongers, and adulterers. Now those have some connection, but also some quite variance, don't they? They don't have a lot in common, but they do have some things in common. So the question is, which one seems to be a faithful translation of the text? Well, pornos has this interesting root. It comes from this word, the prosco, which means to buy or sell. There's, so it seemed to have something to do with selling and sex. So it could be that the King James might be pretty accurate here in its interpretation and translation, is that, is that whoremongers are those who sell people in prostitution. And so it seems to be that it might be a good or faithful translation, a pretty close translation, uh, this word peprosco, because it has something to do with sex and selling. Then the word arsenicuites, that's just an interesting word. It's translated there again in the NIV and then in the King James and then in the NRSV as sodomites, them that defile themselves with mankind and perverts, arsenicuites. Now the interesting thing about arsenicuites is that it was a word, unlike pornos, pornos was a fairly common word at the time that the, um, the New Testament was pulled together, but arsenicuites was not. It was a, it was a relatively brand new word. Uh, some people will claim that Paul is the first person to have used this or the, the author of uh, first timothy was the first person to have used this word um 
if not the first person, one of the very first people. Uh, the, so the question is, when you have a new word, a neologism, a brand new word, how do you construct that word? And so oftentimes it's a compound word, a word that involves the pulling together of multiple words from other places. Um, and sometimes that means that the word brings with it its connotations, and sometimes it means it brings with it brand new connotations. An example would be the word notebook is a compound word, and it pulls the word note and pulls it with the word book and puts them together to create this place where notes are kept inside a book. That makes sense. So the word, the original words provide a meaning to the second word. Well, the it doesn't always work. The word understand doesn't necessarily work that well. It's two words, under and stand, that come together and they don't seem to necessarily correlate with the original meanings of under and stand in this new word, understand. So just because two words exist before they come together to make a new word doesn't automatically mean that we know what they mean. So we need to look a little bit what Arseno Kuites might mean. So Arsen is uh, translated into Septuagint. So in the Old Testament, it's translated into the Greek New Testament, the Greek Old Testament. Uh, that was uh, utilized in uh, Paul's day, uh, the early New Testament days. Um, it means male, and then uh, kuite meant um, bed. So it meant so this word has something to do with men, males, and bed. So there's a question: is what do we get from that? So how what more information can we gather from this word male bed? Let's see if we can understand it a little bit in its context. So there's nowhere else that word appears in the New Testament, just like it does there. Um, sort of independently and, and on its own, but it does appear next to the word pornos, which is handy. Um, so that might give us some sort of context in its understanding of it. Um, but also, uh, there's, there are a few early Christian writings and related texts, some uh, texts that, uh, that connect to the early Christian tradition, uh, the Sibylline Oracles and the Acts of John. So these are two places where that word arsenicuites and the word pornos, or sorry, the word arsenicuites does appear. Um, and so that gives us a little bit of sort of handy insight that there might be some sort of extra canonical or sort of resources outside of the New Testament to give us an insight into what this text might mean. And so we're, we did a little bit of word study. Now we're doing some comparative work, comparing what the context and how early Christians might have been using this word. This is from the Sibylline Oracles. So never accept in your hand a gift which derives from unjust deeds. Do not steal seeds. Whatever takes, whoever takes for him, himself is a curse to generation of generations to the scattering of the life. Do not practice our senequites. Do not betray information. Do not murder. Give one who has labored his wage. Do not oppress a poor man. Take heed of your speech. Keep a secret matter in your heart. Make provisions for orphans and widows and those in need. Do not be willing to act unjustly and therefore do not give leave to one who acts unjustly, who is acting unjustly. So there you see I left our senequites not translated. But interestingly enough, you'll see that it is listed with a series of bad things, things you wouldn't necessarily want to recommend. Don't steal. That's something you probably wouldn't recommend to people or, or take advantage of people who have uh, labored and not pay them. Um, but it's interesting that there are no other references in this particular series of bad things to things that have to do with sexual practices. Our Senequi does seem to stand out like a sore thumb, unless it has something to do less with sexual practices and more has to do with some sort of exploitative practices. But lots of those things in that list there have to do with exploitative practices. They also have to do with exploitative practices, and some of them have to do with exploitative practices and money. So do not steal, do not um, keep someone, um, uh, the labor that they have, they, they appropriately um, have, should be paid for, do not oppress a poor man, et cetera. So there's, you see there's something connection there with exploitation and money that seems to be connected to this word. Interestingly also, in the Acts of John, you'll see here, you will delight in gold and ivory and jewels. Do you see your loved possessions when night comes? And you who give away, give way to soft clothing and then depart from life, will these things be useful in the place where you are going? Let the murderers know that their punishment has been, uh, that he has earned awaits him in double measure after he leaves this world. So also the prisoner, the sorcerer, the robber, the swindler, and the arsenicuites, the thief, and all of his band. So you see there again is a list of, of um, some bad things. Um, arsenicuites, I did not translate it, but again, it stands out all on its own. Um, it it appears to be something that has to do with, again, has a, this sexual connotation, but no other sexual word to reference there. It has to do with some sort of exploitative word, um, maybe also something that has to do with, um, with money, because the word robber, swindler, um, or syndicates, and thief are all listed in a row. There might be something there with exploitation and money again. So it seems that the Sibylline Oracles and the Acts of John both assume there's something to do with this word and money and sexual exploitation. Now, I don't know if we have time. I don't want to be, I want to be conscious of our time. Um, 
Um, so I'm going to think a little bit more about this text. I'm not going to go into the um, the, the couple of texts that reference uh, uh, pornos outside of uh, the scripture, but we'll think about uh, that word at the very end as we do them together. So, um, so what kind of behaviors that is more religious, economic, and sexual, et cetera, are described in the above passages, particularly immediately before or after our word? Well, I've already kind of led into that answer. That is, there seems to be something going on in this text that has to do with, um, with human sexuality, but a kind of sexuality that's got to do with exploitation and with money. So there's something going on there in that particular text. Now, interestingly enough, in the, both the Civil and Oracles and in uh, the Acts of John, there are lists of uh, sexual vices. And so you'll see this, I've listed here for the Civil and Oracles. I won't, re won't read that for you. But you see there's a list of sexual vices. And interestingly enough, the word arsenicoi does not, does not appear in the list of sexual vices. The word arsenicoi appears only in the list of exploitative and economic vices. Similarly, in the Acts of John, there's a list of inappropriate sexual practices. And again, the word arsenicoites does not fall in this list, but falls in the exploitative, exploitative and the economic practices. So we seem to be drawing this kind of conclusion, that there's something to do with sex, economic, and sexual exploitation connected to this word arsenicoites. Um, like I mentioned, I don't really have time to go through the, um, this, the reference to um, the memorabilia and the, and the epistle, but you'll see that in this list of the memorabilia and the epistle, these are both references to the word pornos, and both of these references to the word pornos, um, both sex and economics intersect. And in each instance, pornos is used to describe the one who benefits from the economic exploitation of something else. So you see there's something interesting about the fact that in this, this uh, passage from 1 Timothy, there's a listing of these, ex these exploitative practices that are to be avoided in this vice list. And in that vice list with these uh, exploitative practices where they are listed, the word um, arsenicuites and the word pornos are listed side by side. One of them has to do with someone who exploits somebody, and the other one has to do with the one who is exploited, uh, who's part of the exploitation for sexual practice. So there's something going on there that seems to involve sex and exploitation, but also money. That seems to be what it is that the, the author of the, uh, the epistle seems to be concerned about. All right, so some conclusions. First, we may conclude that 1 Timothy offers descriptions of practices that are condemned, yet those practices do not necessarily correlate to what we might call uh, homosexual relationships, certainly not any kind of modern construction of homosexual relationships as we understand them today. And then second, the term arsenicoites from 1 Timothy means something that involves sex, economics, and exploitation. However, exactly what that means remains somewhat ambiguous. We're not exactly sure what that means. It's a very complicated word. It's a new word, but it certainly doesn't seem to mean uh, sort of homosexual relationships in the way that oftentimes people translate that term in modern contexts. So my general assumption is, and we can talk about this in a moment as uh, we, we kind of resume back to our community, and um, get to see each other's faces again, is that um, there seems to be something going on in this particular passage that is about exploitation, but I'm not exactly sure if it's the kind of passage upon which we can build a modern understanding of human sexuality and appropriate doctrine, doctrinal practices within the life of the church to be commendable for how it is that we are to engage in sexual practices. It seems to be a kind of passage that's completely unrelated to what we might call human sexuality, and far more has to do with um, exploitative economic practices. It might also might happen to relate to, uh, to sex, but it doesn't seem to be the basis or be the place to provide the basis for a doctrine of human sexuality in the church. I think that's it. Any questions? I'm going to go back to you, Rodney. I think you're up. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, what you just did there to help us to understand that when we talk about scriptural interpretation, we often make fundamental mistakes if we believe that scriptural interpretation is uh, simple, uh, if it's non-complex, if it uh, is void, uh, that it can be void of contextual understandings and uh, analysis of things like words that are unusual and uh, quite difficult to understand. So thank you for helping us to wrestle with that a bit. Uh, and I'd love for us to go into greater dialogue about how this relates to the larger conversation about sex and sexuality. Before I do that, I'm going to start with a question that's uh, basically simple uh, to just get us started. Uh, Melissa and Tim, why do you both believe that as people of faith, we're often so reticent to even talk about sex, sexuality, and sexual orientation? 
What about our tradition as Christians, as people of faith, has uh, made this such a taboo subject? Melissa, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you. Um, so I was raised Church of God in Christ. Church of God in Christ is probably the, lar the largest Pentecostal denomination. And um, as a child, I was always hearing messages. It's not Adam and Steve, but Adam and Eve. So I always, I grew up hearing this language that um, told us that having desires to have sex with people who were of our same gender was wrong. And not only that, but that culture also expressed how women and children voice were voiceless, basically. So I believe that because there is this, this culture of, um, there's this purity culture, there's this need for, and I'm, I'm speaking from my perspective in the black community and as a person of African descent, there has been a culture to remain clean and um, saved and sanctified. We were taught to preserve ourselves for marriage and um, to do so with only one man and one woman. And um, anything else is, is not right. And I believe that that has happened to not only just um, because of the indoctrination of the uh, doctrine, but because of how we were indoctr indoctrinated as persons of African descent from persons of European descent to keep us uh, marginalized, to keep us um, not liberated. So I believe certain cultures have just been shifted and passed down to keep people um, small, if you will, or, or less explorative or not free. Thank you, ma'am. My turn? Okay, I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> um, what I, yes, I'll echo that. And, um, um, but I think, Part of what I would assume that underlies a lot of our um, um, hesitancy to have conversations about, about sex and sexuality, particularly in the United States, particularly in churches in the United States, is that, um, is that most of the time when we engage in theological conversations, we assume we're engaging in theological conversations that begin um, primarily out of um, sort of a religious set of practices and values that then try to, we use to try to interpret how does we are to engage in the world when I think actually it's oftentimes the inverse that is happening and it's unconscious. Is that, is that we are actually operating on the assumptions of what we think are appropriate or inappropriate behaviors and practices that are culturally based and then we impose those into our interpretation of the text. And so those, so it's, it's a sort of a, um, it's a, it's a, there, there's always a mutual interpretive action between the text and the people. But I think we're unconscious of it, and we assume that the text is interpreting us, but we are actually the people interpreting the text, and we're not aware of it. And so it's really our cultural conditions and conditioning that we're allowing, and our assumptions about sex and sexual practices within our larger cultural context that we then impose upon the text, and we assume that then the text will reinforce the already presumed cultural positions. And so I think that's really what's going on. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I wanna... can, I, can, I, can I also include that? some of the hesitancy is that a lot of us don't know about that you know um some of us have not had any type of sexual education that has been comprehensive uh meaning sexual education that started when we were young and one that affirmed us to as we are older and aging adults um so i i'll say that the lack of conversation is because some people just don't know about it Thank you for that. Uh, I, I want to move the conversation a bit further into the scriptural realm for a second. Uh, I mentioned uh, one passage earlier today, Genesis chapter 2, the latter part of Genesis chapter 2, which really does emphasize the notion of human sex, uh, and sexuality. Uh, the two are naked and unashamed. Uh, uh, this, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and uh, cleave to his wife. They're naked and unashamed, uh, yada, yada, yada. Uh, why is it that we don't think about the sexual dimensions of a passage like this uh, and we almost sterilize it 
in the way that we talk about it. And then when we finish, I want to talk about another passage that we often read sexual implications into that may have less to do with sex. So let's start with that passage. Tim? Oh, that's for me? Or that's for the... Either one of you. Oh, um, yeah, so I, what, I, what I say is that um, um, I, I do think that, that particular passage, the, the notion of, um, of, of cleaving uh, or, or any, any of those passages within the New Testament that, that are um, uh, relatively sanitized in our interpretation, our reading of them, um, again, I think it has, it has a large, and a large measure has to do with um, our, our modern reading of the scriptural text with a particular, um, um, a particular Puritan um, influence reading that's cultural and not necessarily religious. So, for example, if you run across um, um, folks from different uh, cultural contexts who engage in some of the same readings of the text, uh, so for example, I have many friends who are Scandinavian uh, Christians, and they are befuddled by our particular readings of texts, both the old and the new, and, the, and assume the ones that have to do with, so ones that we assume in our cultural context have to do with sex, and particularly prohibitions against sexual practices and certain kinds of sexual practices. Um, they have never heard them read that way, and vice versa, texts that we assume have nothing to do with sexual and sexual practices, um, they, they presume do. Um, and so I think oftentimes it has to do with um, there's a particular reading of the scriptural text that is very culturally specific to, um, to the American cultural context of the church that we think is universally read and is not the case. Um, so I think that that's, that's part of what's going on there is that it's a cultural reading of the text and not an actual reading of the text itself. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, I'd love to have you jump in on a text that we frequently hear in conversations about human sexuality, human sexual orientation. It's the Genesis 19 passage. And the Genesis 19 passage, which is perhaps the most significant of the quote unquote clobber text, is often used to say that this text is talking about a prohibited form of sexuality. I'd love to have you weigh in on that for a second. You're on mute. You're still, uh, Melissa, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm mindful that we all read the Bible from a different lens. So whenever I hear texts uh, used like that, I remind people that the Bible was not written to me, for me, or about me. And I start there because I'm mindful that as we study scripture, we have to understand the historical context. And we have to realize that the things that were happening in the Bible was written for a certain people at a certain time at a certain space. And as we realize and as we read the Bible, we can embrace that things have changed. Um, there are some things that, um, that exist now that didn't exist in the Bible. And um, I mean, and there are some things that are are the same, but as I read the Bible, I interpret it in a way that is liberating, in a way that um, affirms all of who I am and affirms all of humanity. So I usually don't, I don't go back and forth with people when it comes to um, certain texts like that. I just am gonna automatically say, the Bible should be used to liberate and affirm all of God's children. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, of course, I love that notion of the Bible as a tool for liberation. Uh, it's quite significantly. Um, I want to delve a little bit deeper into this notion, uh, particularly with passages that many people lift up about homosexuality. Uh, many people say, well, okay, maybe the Genesis 19 passage does not deal with homosexuality. Maybe it deals with something different. But it's hard to make a case when you talk about Leviticus chapter 18 and Leviticus chapter 20, uh, that these passages are much clearer in their, uh, in their, their prohibitions against, quote unquote, uh, men playing with men as uh, with uh, a woman. Um, 
love to have some guidance. What do we do with passages like this? And I would invite, if, uh, if Cedric is on the line right now, I'd invite his uh, comments as well. I'd love to hear from him in this regard. <laughs> I, can speak. So I, I think that people, I mean, I think that Tim did a great job by naming that we bring to the text often our own senses of what's right and wrong, and we read into the text, uh, as opposed to exegesis, there's eisegesis, and we, we bring into the text this notion that this particular text will give me backup for my dislike or disapproval of male on male or female on female sex, but specifically male on male. Uh, and so we read that into the text, as opposed to understanding that the understandings of the writers and of the culture and society at the time around human sexuality was very limited. So the value of the male sperm and semen, very important for repopulating and expanding the population. So you have to also understand this notion of uh, spilling the seed uh, is a way of saying this devalues and will limit the population. So we value male sperm. Uh, also, wartime behaviors. So the ways in which to emasculate one would be to take away the power of the masculinity. So we need to read in context. Uh, these passages around the value of maleness versus the devaluing of femaleness. So those culture, the cultural landscape has everything to do with our understanding of what the text is saying and what the text is not saying, uh, as opposed to where we now sit in time and space and our desires for us to back us up, our beliefs and our perspectives. Thank you. I, I could not have Cedric Harmon on the phone and not have him talk at all in this conversation. Uh, thank you for, for speaking up. Um, uh, either, uh, Tim, do you want to weigh in on that question as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Cedric. Um, thank you for affirming what I said before. I appreciate that. Um, the, the, the issue of particularly those two passages in Leviticus, uh, so those are, those are part of some sort of holiness code. And, and uh, I think Cedric was right in his uh, interpretation of um, both the, what it claims about maleness and femaleness, what it values about masculinity and, and devalues of femininity. Um, what it sort of this emphasis it placed on um, on reproduction and repopulation as a sort of a vital and central position. Um, there's also sort of important tenets within the holiness code that relate to uh, separateness and, and difference as a way of distinguishing the uh, the people of God versus the other people around them. Uh, there's there's also I think in, in the particular text and I didn't I didn't interpret place that into the texts that we looked through tonight, but there in the Old Testament um, in those particular texts there's a there's a there's a, a powerful interpretation that has to do with this, uh, this phrase of a uh, terra vote and terra va, um, this notion of, um, of a taboo that we oftentimes translate the, those words in, uh, in English um, into the word abomination is uh, the word that gets oftentimes translated, particularly in the King James Version uh, for those particular practices are called abominations. Uh, but that, the, the concept of abomination there is a far stronger sort of a, a term than, um, than the word terra vote and terra va the words teravot and terava are actually at various places in the Old Testament are used to reference to God. Um, God is described as being teravot or terava. So God can't possibly be considered an abomination um, if that's what the word means. The, the words actually seem to mean more closely akin to something that's against the culture or against our practices. So God is described as being a teravot uh, when referencing to uh, outside peoples as that God is not those people's God's practices are, and ways are not of those people or, or their, their ways. So there's, there's something much more complicated going on in those particular passages than it has to do specifically with a reference um, to sort of an, an absolute claim that a practice is, is, um, is, is fundamentally good or bad. It's much more nuanced and complex than a simple claim of, um, of rejection or affirmation. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, one other thing, uh, before, uh, when we are all not speaking, even if uh, the speakers, if you could put yourself on mute, just because I think it would reduce the feedback. I'd appreciate that. Thank you for that. Uh, I have a question from, uh, from the gathered people today. It says, is the second part of the word coitus a predecessor to the, to the word coitus since it refers to bed? Tim, I open that up to you uh, to wrestle with. 
Uh, yeah, so there, there, there's a, um, a drink there, or sorry, a link there with um, the, the idea of, um, of, uh, of um, bed. There's, there's a particular idea, if you, that, that word, um, uh, coites, when it is used other places in the New Testament, so you can do a specific word search just on uh, coites other places in the New Testament, and I don't have it off the top of my head because I don't have it in front of me. I think it's in Matthew's gospel when that reference uh, comes up. It actually is the reference to the marriage bed. So there, there, there is something very particular about the about the um, the notion of bed there, but it's a um, it is a it is a distinctive connection to some sort of intimate um, uh, relational context or kind of bedding. So it's not just simply about having sex. There seems to be something much more kind of layered and nuanced on top of that. When that word is used by itself within the other places in the New Testament. Thank you for that. I have a question, a general question here. How does one help laypersons and misinformed ministers? Uh, as they try to read and interpret same-sex relationships in scripture uh, and in subsequent texts, uh, religious texts. How, how do you begin to engage uh, ministers and religious leaders as they wrestle with these issues? Melissa, let me start with you on that. Hmm. How do you engage ministers as, as into texts that Say that again. I'm sorry. I was listening. I... Yeah. How do you engage with ministers uh, as they begin to uh, read and interpret same-sex relationships in the Bible? How might you begin, how might you start a conversation, I think is the question, uh, to help them reimagine the way that they look at uh, clobber texts, the way that they look at traditional uh, opinions about same-sex relations? How might you begin that conversation? Um, I will begin the conversation by suggesting that the Bible is not the best resource to discuss um, human sexuality. And I will begin there because what, what seems to happen is whenever this conversation shows up in the faith space, people believe that they can find all the answers they need in the Bible. And we are mindful that the Bible, the way that they lived in the Bible is not how we live now. So the first thing I'll do is try to um, disorient, disorientate them a little bit by taking away the Bible. Next, I will offer a space for some story storytelling, uh, because sometimes what people need to see and hear is that um, we all are going through human sexuality at the same time in different phases and, and some have changed, you know, the way that they believe uh, their sexual sexuality is and some are still um, exploring that. So I would try to create a conversation that opens up the space that allows them to see that everyone's sexuality is fluid. And so that's where I would start. And depending on, and, I, and as you share, I'm always thinking about the congregation as a whole, but if we're just talking with um, the leaders of the church, I would, I would like, I would start with the leaders of the church. And once you get the leaders on, on track, then they will be able to share that with their um, congregants. I think it's very important to have some skilled and professional individuals come share about human sexuality um, in their faith space. And like I mentioned before, I would do so without using the Bible. Interesting. Thank you for that. Tim, I'd like to ask you just the same question, but I think I want to frame it in a slightly different way. You can uh, 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 adhere to the collateral as it were. Um, Scripture is fundamentally important to you. Methodist churches has come off of a long-term conversation about scripture in relationship to sexuality. How do you begin to approach leaders within your own tradition as you talk about these issues? Uh, thank you, Rodney. And, and I, I did um, interject uh, the quadrilateral, so um, my, my own fault for introducing that. Um, the, um, um, but he did just have this little, this little one, two, three, uh, four in my structure there of how we, uh, we approach scripture. I thought it was a little numerology there. It's always good fun. Um, so there, there's a variety of complexities within the United Methodist tradition. Um, so 
well, it led me to talk about sort of generally within the Methodist tradition and then some particular context. So within the United, United Methodist tradition generally, the idea of the quadrilateral is a relatively recent introduction. Um, it, was a, um, it was a concept that was, that was established by Albert Outler in the 1960s and his, re, his reading of John Wesley to identify within what he, saw West, what he thought within Wesley was an interpretive um, matrix of how it is that Wesley engaged um, sort of in the formation of doctrine and theology. Um, he also would articulate that the notion of the quadrilateral was never always operative at any one moment in uh, Wesley. So that means that, that even when John Wesley was writing himself, uh, he might utilize four different um, uh, sort of sources or, uh, or uh, resources to draw upon for the construction of theology. But he thought that Wesley never relied upon uh, all four at any given time. He's always draw, relying upon different components of them. He also would say that scripture always had a central position in all those interpretive positions. So that so scripture sort of held the trump card, as it were. Um, so that, that's all to be said. That, so it's sort of a complicated history um, about how the quadrilateral of the, quadrilateral is utilized uh, generally. Um, within uh, the Methodist tradition currently, there's debates about how it is that the quadrilateral is to be, em be, to be employed and what it actually means. Because uh, you saw that I mentioned that there's a, a distinction. This is a, a um, Rex um, Maddox will talk about this. They'll talk about um, uh, the distinctions um, within the sort of the not only the, the priority given to the various parts of the quadrilateral, but the fact that there's two primary sources that scripture and tradition are the sources, and that tradition, I'm sorry, that, that experience and uh, reason are the interpretive means by which you engage the two sources. So there's really only two sources with two interpretive means. So there's even kind of debate within uh, the Methodist tradition about how it is we utilize quadrilateral. So therefore, how it could be employed for the construction of a doctrine on uh, any kind of ethical position, including human sexuality. But presently, the um, Methodist Church is meant to have a general conference where we're to debate um, more rigorously than we have in um, several decades uh, the issue of human sexuality. We had a we had a call special session just last year to talk about human sexuality. This upcoming year's um, a couple of weeks is meant to be our our quadrennial gathering to discuss um, how it is we're meant to move forward as a church on the issue of human sexuality. Conversation we've been having since 1970 in the church. Um, Every, every couple of years we get together and, and, and fight over it. Uh, but unfortunately, um, as of yesterday, the, uh, the general conference was called off um, because of the, the virus. Um, so, uh, so we'll have to wait a little bit longer for the methods to figure out what we're doing moving forward. Um, but it's a very complicated um, debate with, internally within our church because there's even disagreements on how it is that the quadrilateral, if you agree the quadrilateral exists, how does the quadrilateral is meant to be applied? Um, so therefore, how scripture fits within the quadrilateral. That's a long answer. Thank you for that. Um, and how about I, I we end with this question right here? Uh, and this is a basic question. Uh, so uh, we have sexuality that we engage in in various ways in community. But where does God fit into sexuality? Uh, what does God have to say about our own understandings of sexuality? Where does God fit in? Uh, do we valorize scripture? Do we uh, reduce the significance of scripture in our contemporary era? And where do we think God fits in this larger conversation? There's a song uh, we sing um, during an owl training and it goes, God gave me sexuality, healthy, holy sexuality. God is in the midst of all of us. And because we are made in God's image, we were created to be sexual beings. So where does God fit? I believe as long as we are in healthy relationships um, that has mutual consent, God is in the mix, and um, and that's where I stand. It's as simple as that. Tim, thank you. No, that's that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I always um, go to the incarnation. Is that um, and this is similar to the uh, to the reflection that Melissa read at the very beginning. Is that if God is truly fully human 
and fully divine as we um, hold in the incarnation, then uh, that's an affirmation of what it means to be a person with a body. Um, that's why my, um, my chapter um, in that book is, um, is um, about disjointed bodies. Um, that uh, if we talk about human sexuality, we seem to pull the, the body, our bodiliness out of um, its context and, uh, and disregard it or devalue it. And when we do that, we're also disregarding and devaluing God um, because God saw the, the body was worth taking on. And if God was, thought the body was good to have, then we should be delighted in the fact that we have bodies too. Mm -hmm. That's where I always kind of land up on that. Amen. Well, let me just say this today. Thank you for that answer. Thank you, Melissa, for that, uh, your answer. And thank you both for a thought-provoking conversation this evening, giving us an opportunity to weigh into uh, issues of sexuality and scripture, uh, helping us begin a much deeper conversation that I hope will continue to unfold as we go further. I think we've got a whole lot more territory that we can cover going forward as we wrestle with uh, other issues about sex and sexuality in the intersection with the church. And I hope that as we all go forward, we will not think about this as a taboo subject, but think about this as something that God made, as uh, Reverend McQueen Simmons just said. I think about this as something that God valued, as Dr. Moore just said, uh, enough to be embodied in a sexualized body. Uh, so uh, as we think about these issues, I hope that we recognize that they are not devoid of theological content, but they are deeply theological issues and theological concerns. Dare I say that sex and sexuality is a deeply theological matter and something that needs to be handled uh, in our own uh, thinking about God and what God's role for us in this world is. Let me thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you all for joining us in this new way. Uh, I've enjoyed this opportunity to uh, come together in spite of the quarantine. Uh, it's nice to be to have other modes of fellowship when we can't get together face to face. Uh, and let's hope that we can continue to come back and have these conversations. We've got scheduled currently a dangerous dialogue for uh, the third Thursday in April that focuses on Earth Day as we deal with issues of creation care. And I hope that you'll join us for that conversation uh, as well as uh, work with us throughout this whole period of uh, Corona and as we reimagine the way that we can reach out to the larger community to foster dangerous dialogues. Let's end with a word of prayer. Holy One, you are great and gracious to us and we your people are grateful for whatever occasion we can have to come together to talk about your will, your word, your way, and to do so with sisters and brothers who believe as we do. Lord, as we come before you now, we Thank you for this conversation. We ask that it would be fruitful for our hearts and souls, that it would open up our minds in new ways, and Lord, that we would go forward to be conduit of this message. Lord, we also ask that as we go forward, we would be part of a larger welcoming community that embraces all of your humanity and recognizes that no one should be prohibited based upon our negative understandings of their sexual orientation, their sexual identity, or the way that they, through you, have found their sexual understanding. Lord, as we gather before you right now, we ask that you would protect us all in these dangerous days. Watch over us and keep us as we are under quarantine, self-quarantine, and a larger, uh, increasingly uh, a larger state of quarantine. But help us to find ways to continue to creatively serve you even in the midst of this hour. For Christ's sake, amen. God bless you all and see you all again next month. Amen. 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 amen.